have that one. We saw you enough times now, and you even get the claps in the right place. Uh, welcome to Trinity. We'd like you to know Trinity, if, if you're here for the first time, no matter who you are, no matter where you are on planet Earth, no matter who you love or how you identify, we welcome you into the full life of the ministry, this loving congregation. So, welcome to Trinity. Um, I would like to, uh, normally I don't do this, but since it's Neil and Jennifer, I'm going to single you out and uh, you know, hold you up in front of everybody at the church. Uh, but it's good to see, I was really surprised to see uh, my friends Neil and Jennifer walk in with my new friends, John and Sandy. Uh, we had dinner together on uh, Friday night, I guess it was. And uh, yeah, Friday night. And Teresa, it was actually Teresa's birthday. And they did a cake. and. Uh, I met John and Sandy, and Neil and Jennifer and John and Sandy, both uh, couples, uh, are Garrison Keillor fans, uh, Prairie Home Companion fame, and I've taken a number of cruises uh, with uh, Garrison Keillor. And John and Sandy uh, also provided music when we had dinner on Friday night. Uh, John is quite a songwriter, and, uh, and uh, one of the songs that he did, of course, was a get a deal Neil. And it's about Neil, who is also here today. Uh, it's about Neil always trying to get a deal everywhere he goes. So ushers watch him when he puts his offering in the plate today. He'll probably try to get it for half price. I am delighted to have you here today. Thank you for coming here. For our announcements uh, today, um, Sunday school is still in our community hall at 9.30. Tai Chi, not today. Gerald was in Asheville last night. Didn't think he would be up for being here today, so we're missing him in our sound booth today. But thank you, Bob, for taking care of everything this morning up there. Um, but Tai Chi is on the second and fourth Thursdays here in our community halls. Also, September Angel sign-up sheets are in the back. And gratitude for the August Angels. Uh, September 24th, you can bring, that's two Sundays from today, bring your off, uh, offerings of eyeglasses that need recycling, and we'll get those to the Lions Club to make that happen. On October 1st, we have our worship and foods holy communion. It's World Communion Sunday on October 1st. And we're going to be asking you for some stories about how you share bread for meals with others in other places or with people from other countries. Um, and also you can bring artifacts to display from around the world if you have some of those. Um, also in October, we return to bring our peanut butter and grape jelly. And on Wednesday the 18th, The Smell of Money is a movie that's going to be aired here. It's a documentary about some hog farms in North Carolina. And what's happening in some of the uh, uh, racial disparities that are becoming very prominent and how those hog lagoons uh, are done and also when they flood, what happens. Also, a new members gathering on October 29th. Um, I wanted to also give you an explanation, a little bit more explanation from last Sunday about uh, Reverend Dr. Kathy Cook. If anybody wasn't here and you want to know what she said to the congregation, I've got some copies. I can get you those. I'll bring them with me at the back if somebody will remind me at the end of the service. Um, some of you had questions about her resignation as pastor of evangelism here because of keeping her standing in the United Methodist Church. Uh, some were wondering if she could even preach here. Yes, I assure you, she, she can still preach here. And, and she and Ken can still be a part of our congregation here. And in fact, Kathy will be guest preaching uh, the next two Sundays here while I'm away. She'll also be the person who will respond to any uh, of your pastoral care needs uh, in the two weeks that I'm away. So I just want to reassure you that not much changes. It's just that we can't do anything, she can't do anything official uh, as a part of uh, serving as staff in a church other than in the United Methodist Church. 
Uh, so, yeah, I know, I'm shaking my head too, but, uh, uh, <laughs> and, and I could add some injury to that insult as well <laughs> by telling you that uh, it's perfectly okay for UCC ministers to serve United Methodist congregations right now. And I have a friend, John Wallace, who's an ordained UCC minister, who's actually going to be our emergency backup uh, for pastoral care while I'm gone, uh, who is serving a couple of United Methodist churches up in Kannapolis and China Grove. So uh, anyway, there's just there's a time right now where the United Methodists need to do this. And there was a time when the UCC had to do this. Uh, so it isn't something... Uh, that uh, we didn't expect, really, or see coming, but it was a surprise for all of us. So, um, anyway, I just want to reassure you about that. She'll be here next Sunday, uh, and uh, today is her birthday. We'll say that during the prayer time as well, uh, but we'll, we'll cover that in just a moment. Are there any other announcements? Teresa? Oh. Competed in the state final of the senior games two weeks in ago, two Thursdays ago. And he not only won first place in his age group, shooting the kind of bow that he shoots, but he also outscored the guy who was gold on the, who won the gold in his younger age group. Well, thank you, dear, <laughs> for that accolade. Yeah, it was fun. I really enjoyed it. Okay. Let us center ourselves for worship today. I invite you to rise in body and or in spirit for our responsive intent. Rejoice and be glad, for God takes delight in us. Sing to God a new song. Come and hear God's good news. Even when only two or three are gathered, Christ is here in our midst. With dance and melody, join me, praise and prayer, let us worship God who is among us in this place. 
Our hymn of community is one that I'm not sure we've done as a congregation. The choir has done it a few times. It's been a while. Uh, it's not what's listed in your bulletin. I got it wrong this week. Uh, it's number 309 instead, and it's We Are Your People. For our prayer time today, uh, there are a number of concerns on the back of your bulletin. Uh, sort of first and foremost on our screen are the families that are grieving. We add to that the family of Gary, Jim, McNutt's uncle. Uh, they are leaving this coming Wednesday for memorial service for him and the others who have been on our list we remember in our prayers also. And then others who are in need of healing in one way, shape, or form. Um, uh, Gail, Gail's sister, uh, Teresa's sister Gail is someone who is new on your prayer list today who had teeth pulled for some implants and one of the posts is not cooperating properly. So prayers for that to be made right. And uh, Bob told me that his mom, Laura, had the pacemaker put in. Things went well, so great for that. Um, let's see, anybody else? Alex, can I provide a quick update? My mama's home, um, so she's not in um, a nursing home anymore. She's at home now. Oh, good. Um, and Michelle's mom's surgery is this Wednesday. Okay. Ashley's mom is home, not in the nursing home anymore. anymore. Michelle's mother, mm -hmm. mom, she has surgery, has surgery on Wednesday. And you also had a celebration, right? We had a new nephew. A new nephew. On Tuesday. On He's Tuesday. Eight pounds, fifteen ounces, and twenty-two inches long. Eight pounds, fifteen ounces, full-grown baby boy. Yes. Any others? Kathy. For celebration, 
25th anniversary. Wow. Congratulations. And Regina is still under the weather, so we're continuing to remember her in our prayers, too. Neil. Wow. She passed away two weeks ago. I'm sorry. What was her name? Elizabeth DiPicciato. Elizabeth DiPicciato. And you may not have heard, but Neil was saying she, she survived the Hitler onslaught. Hitler onslaught. Yeah. Others. Debbie, yeah, how's things going with you and Pat? Pat has had a, a pretty good week. He started physical therapy. He's getting stronger. So those are all good things. And then I also wanted to mention the traveling records for you and Teresa. Yes. Thank you. Debbie said that Pat is, uh, had physical therapy. He's getting stronger. And she also asked for traveling mercies for Teresa and myself as we leave on Wednesday. So we're looking forward to that. Thank you for the prayers, for all of you. Any others? Morocco. Morocco. Earthquake. All right. Celebrations. Uh, of course, Reverend Dr. Kathy Cook's birthday is today. Oh, Cecil. Indeed, yeah. I was about to say they've been on our prayer list for a long, long time, and the reason is there is still a lot of need for prayer in the United Methodist Church yeah, among the leadership. Um, Reverend Dr. Cook's birthday is today. She's spending that with her family. And also Kathy Costner has a birthday coming up. Uh, Cecil has a birthday, I think, tomorrow also. So happy birthday to you. Uh, was that it, Sheila? That's what you were going to say? Okay. Any other birthdays or anniversaries? Celebrations. Neil. John and Sandy on Tuesday will be celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary. Oh. John and Sandy, the 30th wedding anniversary on Tuesday. Happy anniversary to you, too. All right. Let us pray. God, we're grateful for this day. We're thankful for this time of prayer. Within the context of worship, we're thankful for this gathering of people as a community of faith. We're thankful for your presence among us in whatever way we might imagine, particularly in the bodies and faces and beings of those around us in this space today. We're thankful for each one who is here with us physically and those who are joining us online as well and will be a part of us this week as they watch our service online. We're mindful of those who we miss and are not among us and we pray for them and for their well-being and health and traveling mercies. We pray you would be with those, O oh God, who are grieving for various reasons, those who have lost loved ones, some of them tragic, others as people have gotten older, others through illness. We pray for comfort and peace in the lives of those who are left behind to live out life with loss. We pray for peace for them. We pray for those who suffer illnesses physically and emotionally and mentally, psychologically. We're grateful for their presence in our lives and we pray, dear God, for healing and wholeness for them, for better ways to respond and make accessible health care for those who are in need, particularly of mental health care. We ask, dear God, that you would be with those who move through this world in different ways than those of us who walk through it 
and what some have defined as somewhat normal. We recognize all of us as normal, though some of us walk through with limitations that others do not, and we pray for those who walk through this world with limited ways. We're thankful for their presence in our lives, and we pray that we might be sensitive to their needs and ways of making life normal for them. Again, as the dominant culture might define that term. Help us, God, to be more understanding of those who are different. We pray for those who inhabit bodies in this world that are different from our bodies, who, whose gender is different from ours, and whose identity may be different also from our own. Help us to continue our pursuit of understanding based in our capacity to love in the name of Christ. In the name of all that is good, which you, O oh God, grant us. We pray that you would hear our prayers for those around our world, particularly those in Morocco and suffering the devastating effects of earthquake. We pray for them as they sort through the rubble as lives have been lost. We ask, O oh God, for you to be there in forms of emergency aid and help, but also in long-term counseling for people all over our world who've lost loved ones tragically. We pray for all those in places in our world where there is deep pain and suffering. We ask you make us mindful and compassionate to be able to care in ways that bring change in policy and procedures and getting help and relief and making life better. In your mercy, O oh God, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers for those who are struggling and dealing with and continuing to fight cancer and terminal illnesses. We pray for Martin and for Pat. We pray for strength and courage. We pray for their caregivers and for family members. We pray for others who suffer with cancer and fight it and with other illnesses. We pray for wholeness and for health and for better life in whatever form that takes. Pray for strength for those in our health care system who give and give and give and give, as do teachers in our school systems who give and give and give and give. And we pray for students. We pray for the energies of those who lead for stamina and strength. And we pray for students to learn well the ways that are good and helpful for all of us that teach values that embrace community among us and help us identify our responsibility to one another. God, in your mercy, hear all our prayers. Our prayers celebrating birthdays and anniversaries and moments of new birth and our prayers grieving and in need of comfort, our prayers in need of healing. Hear all those prayers too, those that we offer from our heart, the ones for which we don't have words and cannot even express. Hear our prayers, O oh God a better world. Hear us now, O oh God, as we pray of you, as you have taught us to pray. Our Mother, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may notice sometimes that whenever we say uh, that prayer, that I'll pause after forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You know why I do that? No, because I want to give people opportunity if they learned it saying trespasses to say their trespasses. So it's just trying to be sensitive to the needs of people who are here that I may not know. So uh, just note going forward. You can do that too. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. If your sister or brother should commit some wrong against you, go and point out the error, but keep it between the two of you. If she or he listens to you, you have won a loved one back. If not, try again, but take one or two others with you so that every case may stand on the word of two or three witnesses. If your sister or brother refuses to listen to them, refer the matter to the church. If she or he ignores even the church, then treat that sister or brother as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. The truth is, whatever you declare bound on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you declare loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you, if two of you on earth join in agreement to pray for anything whatsoever, it will be granted you by my Abba, God in heaven. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in your midst. Here is the reading. Thanks be to God.
I'm just going to give you a disclaimer right up front on this sermon today. You know, sometimes preachers preach and they stay right with the Bible itself and the scripture that they had read. That may or may not happen today. Just saying. I know people sort of make fun of us Southerners. The way we approach snowstorm possibilities. Somebody ought to be saying amen. Cleaning out all the milk and sugar at the grocery store 10 days before. But you have to admit there is something good about being prepared just in case. I recall a time several years ago in the midst of hurricane season when a storm was predicted and we, the people in my house, knew we should get batteries and locate candles and have matches on hand in case we lost power. But as the hurricane came and left us in the dark for quite a while, it seems we didn't really have a sense of a goose. I remember many people I talked to in the storm's wake saying things like, you know, you just don't appreciate electricity until you don't have it. And we often don't know what we have until it's gone. I'd like to think that often that is the case in the community of faith called church today. I would like to think that Sometimes when people are gone, we miss them. I think we do. This passage from Matthew today speaks a little bit about how to handle church conflict. In fact, it's pretty good, pretty good advice on how to do that. You know, you talk to the person you have a problem with, and if that doesn't help, then you, you, know, you go with somebody else, and you keep talking until you sort of try to work things out. But when things are going well in the church, and I feel like things are going pretty well in this church right now, we tend to just breeze by such passages and maybe not fully appreciate them where we end up tending to focus just on verse 20 where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I with them. Often we've used this passage, that particular verse, to bless and redeem an ill-attended church service or event, maybe. And I suppose maybe a full church, even with a lot of conflict, might be desired more than an empty one where everybody gets along. I don't know. That's kind of a toss-up. But are those the only options? One byproduct of the pandemic in this country has been a drop in church attendance for every congregation I know. I haven't heard of a single church or synagogue or other house of worship that's being better attended now than it was in January 2019 or January 2020 even. Other community groups have faced are experiencing similar number declines. Folks have always found reasons not to attend church, though. The time, <laughs> the day, long sermons. That was my brother's favorite. Boring, that was also my brother's favorite. Don't like so-and-so, that's often been my favorite. <laughs> so-and-so is not nice to me. That's an easy one golf, whatever, we can find a reason if we don't want to be there. And sometimes those are legitimate reasons. I'm not going to judge that. Sometimes church can be a place where a lot of pain is caused and a lot of pain is being caused. You don't need to be there. If it isn't a healthy place where people communicate well with each other and support each other, if it isn't a place where people experience it as a group where there is comfort and the bearing of each other's burdens and sharing celebrations together. We do that during our prayer time. One of the reasons we do that is so we know about each other's lives. And if it's not one of those places, then it's just, one, it's just like another place that you could be on Sunday morning. 
Some today are decrying the irrelevance of the church. Many say the church isn't with it in terms of gender and sexuality or electronic communication. And that's a fair criticism of a lot of houses of worship. But 40 million Americans, I read in our article this week, have stopped going to church in the past 25 years. That represents 12% of the total population. Not 12% of church goers, 12% of the total population in this country. 40 million people. It represents the largest concentrated change in church attendance in American history. And I wonder, did we fail to pick up some of the necessary things we needed <laughs> in order to make it through whatever this is that's happening now with church attendance? Did we fail to do something we needed to do to keep attracting people? Or were we missing something that would have changed this decline? And I don't know. You know, there's a, there's a good part of me that sort of grieves this kind of loss, but there's another part of me that also says, you know what, maybe it just needs to be this way right now. Maybe we need to miss something before we realize what it was offering us in the first place. A writer for The Atlantic says, As a Christian, I feel this shift acutely. My wife and I wonder whether the institutions and communities that have helped preserve us in our own faith will still exist for our children or let alone for whatever grandchildren we might one day have. The article is entitled, The Misunderstood Reason Millions of Americans Stop Going to Church, and it's subtitled, the defining problem driving people out is just how American life works in the 21st century. The article in The Atlantic was written by Jake Meter. He's editor-in-chief of a publication called Mere Christianity, or I'm sorry, Mere Orthodoxy, which is itself a publication that leans more conservatively than I do. And, uh, and also then is wise, particularly regarding gender and sexuality. But his article piqued my interest enough that the post floating through my Facebook feed became clickbait for me, and I found myself getting a trial subscription to The Atlantic just to read the whole article, which I'll cancel this afternoon. <laughs> now, I like The Atlantic, but I can't afford it. This'll, these things add up. I also subscribe to the to the New York Times. So right now I don't feel like I want to do both of those. His article was actually a book review of The Great De-Churching, written by a couple of other conservative Christian authors. Meter, Jake Meter contends that rather than being true to the nature of the church, the church has followed too closely the ideals of contemporary America, which it says simply isn't set up to promote mutual, mutuality of care or common life, community, or groupness, if you will. Rather, he says, America today is designed to maximize individual accomplishment as defined by professional and financial success. Such a system, he says, leaves precious little time or energy for forms of community that don't contribute to one's professional life or, as one ages, of course, to the lives, the pros professional prospect in the lives of one's children or grandchildren. Workism reigns in America, he says. And because of it, community in America Religious community, he says, included, I would say especially, is a math problem that just doesn't add up. And I kind of get that. The church is based, other communities of faith, synagogues, houses of worship, are based on community. Being together in mutual support and love, we say this in our baptismal vows. When a child is baptized, when, 
When a child is confirmed, when a person grows up to own their own faith, we say the same words again. We pledge our mutual love, support, and care. We say that when people become official members here in our house of faith. And we say that we pledge our mutual love, support, and care. And also there is that story about, you know, the three preachers on Monday morning talking about people leaving their church and one for this reason, one for the other. Oh, no, it was about the bats in the belfry. That's what it was. And how to get rid of the bats. And basically what they all concluded was, let's just get them all together and baptize them and we won't see them again. <laughs> Geese are much better at being church than church is. They're much better at building community and staying in it. Geese take care of each other. In church, it's always a good idea to have the sense of a goose. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know about geese. It's been known for some time that geese will arrive here soon and point south for the winter before returning again in the spring to the north, the frigid, cold north where they know how to deal with snow and not clean out all the grocery store shelves of milk and sugar whenever the storm comes. They'll do so in a V formation, not the northerners, but the birds. And as each bird flaps its wings, it creates uplift for the bird in front of it. Or, I'm sorry, immediately following it. It creates a draft for the bird immediately following it. And by flying in a V formation, the whole flock adds at least 71% greater flying distance than flying alone. I'll wait until the airlines discover this. <laughs> we should have this sense of community, though. It works better when we work together. We have more energy when we gather together on a regular basis. The sense that God gave a goose is also the name of a series of children's books by Gene Davis. And this God-given sense includes not only flying in V formation and taking care of each other, but it includes values that we would like for our children to learn that are a bit of the antithesis of this sort of individual, professional, and financial development. And that is the qualities of caring for each other and encouraging each other and forgiving each other when wronged. The geese and the children's series of books, Allie, Eli, and Annabelle, and many other geese venture through experiences where someone who is hurt needs help, where someone needs a friend, and they venture through a variety of other things that young geese learn to help them live together in a community of mutual support. So as I think about this article and the decline of the church in this country, and there are some things about church in this country that have needed, decline, needed to decline since sort of the beginning of church in this country. So I'm not sad about how, that decline, how the decline may affect some of the things we shouldn't ever have been hanging on to in the first place. But I do believe that the church as the article comes around to suggesting, is in a unique place where we can offer something that is needed and valued in our society that people are not going to get out there in the business world or in other places. And that is community. Community of mutual support and care and love. Just like we say when we, when we are baptized. We can actually be a center for community. We've talked about that some already. Using our space downstairs as a community hall. Offering space in our rooms around our building to others who could use them to do ministries that enhance community within our communities. We can also get together ourselves like at the corn maze we've done for the last, I don't know, three or four years now. And in our own community hall for breakfast on Sunday mornings, maybe. 
and in worship together, and in groups working together on our mission to help others, to provide food, to do what needs to be done to help alleviate suffering and homelessness in this community. We can be a place and offer space for that, through mutual care and support and love. We live in a nation that's become very lonely in its individual pursuits. That loneliness shows up in mental health illnesses and in physical illnesses. It shows up in our contempt for each other of differing political parties. It shows up as well in our arrogance and hubris that comes along with the individual pursuit of wealth without the capacity nor the intent of sharing any of it with those who are in need. Such offense of such hubris shows up in this church sign where eight men in the world own more wealth than 3.6 billion people. And I like the tag on that. But sure, the single mom on food stamps is the problem. Not. I just have to leave it right there for a minute. That's half the population, 3.6 billion people. Eight people own more wealth than half the population combined. That seems like a pretty easy problem to solve. You only have to deal with eight people. The antithesis <laughs> of any sort of community and belonging. A worthy pursuit for a church is to build community that cares. There's some benefits personally individually. Participation, participation in a religious community generally correlates with better, better health. Ugh, I am getting TH tongue-tied. Getting better health outcomes and longer life. Higher financial generosity. Can I get an amen? <laughs> and more stable families of all sorts. All of these community characteristics are desperately needed in a nation with rising rates of loneliness, mental illness, and alcohol and drug dependency, as well as the greed and individualism from which many of our maladies that are epidemic arise. So join me in pledging our mutual support and care of each other. We are making a difference here at Trinity in this community. We'll keep doing that and we'll do it in greater ways, but we'll also need to become a better knit community ourselves in order to do that well. Let's make a bigger difference going forward with the sense of a goose. Amen. I invite you to support ministries of mutual support and care and community with the giving of your offerings at www.paypal.me forward slash comma church or you may drop your offering in the offering plate at the back as we leave today. Our offering will now be received.
I invite you to rise in body and or in spirit for our doxology. For the gift of community, of mutual love, support, and care in the context of this community of faith and in other places in our lives, oh God, we're grateful. As we share our resources, we participate in the care of others. So we give you thanks for that opportunity and for the gifts given. We ask your blessings on these gifts that they might actually become for others who are in great need a sign of our mutuality of love and support and care. In the name of all that is holy, together we all say, Amen. And now go forth being in community, not just in here, but also out there. Being mutually loving, supporting, and caring everywhere you go. Amen. Our sending song is, there's a song deep in my heart, a light burning in my soul. Go in peace. Whoa.